I'm Tony Cusimano. I'm here today with Tom Zaleski from Matrix Dental Laboratory. Tom is our key opinion leader on the Nature Curls Super High Impact product line. And today we have a few questions that we're going to talk to him, questions and answers, and some tips and techniques Tom will provide to our uh, laboratories and customers as well. This will be a reference guide if you have any other questions or you need to refer to something. We'll hope to have the information here for you. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, you know, we were fleshing out an idea on how we could be very effective with our videos. And step-by-step is always nice, but it's always better when you can actually address issues that are concerns of our customers. Um, wh one of the big issues that we have is uh, we'll get a call and it might go to, through two or three different people before we can really get uh, a solid answer. Being that I've been a dental technician for 27 years and have used a host of products out there, I find that it's uh, much easier uh, to fall back on my experience rather than try to read a manual or something like that or instructions. So this, my comments and my suggestions actually come from personal experiences in the laboratory. That's great, Tom. Can I go ahead and ask you the first question? Sure. Okay, I had Larry from a lab in Detroit he had called and his question is, what is the correct way to prepare the material before he uses it? Well, that's a good question, and there is a preparation that's involved in that. Um, a lot of people don't realize the, the journey that the acrylics make on their way to the laboratory, and it all has a bearing on how we prepare the material uh, prior to our dispensing and usage of it. Uh, the big thing is that the material itself comes in a container, and that container is filled uh, at the manufacturing level and then it's taken and put on a pallet and it's taken to the back of the factory and it's riding along on a, on a, uh, a forklift and it goes on the shelf and then uh, the dealer will order the product and then it goes back on a forklift and it goes to a truck where it bounces around and then to the shipping, uh, the, shipping uh, the shipper. Uh, it goes to the shipper and then the, from the shipper it goes to the actual dealer and then the customer orders the product, goes back on a shipper's truck again and goes back and it goes to the customer. Well, by the time it reaches there, um, it has gone up and down and shook so much that it's almost reminiscent of panning for gold where light material tends to migrate to the top and heavier material tends to migrate at the bottom. It's like when they pan for gold, you'd, they would take some soil and put it in the pan and shift it back and forth with some water and then the lighter things would float away and the heavier gold would settle to the bottom. Well, the same thing happens with fibers and pigments and the actual base material. So my suggestion is uh, to prevent any kind of uh, issue later when you begin to use the product. And what I mean by later is if you were to buy a large amount of material, say a five pound container, and you don't prepare the material properly at the beginning, what happens is generally that somewhere in the use of the product, say if you have a five pounder, at about a two and a half to three pound point, you might start to notice, the customer may start to notice a change in color. Of course, this is because at the beginning, the fibers and the pigments were being taken out of the top and were never properly infiltrated. So what I recommend is that when you first get your container of product, whether that product is in a five pound or a one pound container, that you take and rotate or shift the material back and forth rather than shake up and down. Because by shaking the material up and down, you're actually mimicking the same thing that was going on in the truck. By sloshing the material and rolling from side to side, uh, the, the container, what happens is the fibers tend to migrate into each other and you get a finer mix, a better mix. I recommend that not only when you first get the product, but I also recommend doing that uh, every subsequent time that you take the product out to dispense. Uh, this way you're, you're guaranteed that the product is thoroughly mixed and that you're not going to get any kind of a color change later on. Thank you, Tom. That's a great suggestion. Um, can you please Clarify the powder and liquid ratios important to adhere to? Well, actually it is. It's, it's quite important. Uh, I know that uh, being in the industry as long as I have been, I've encountered many people who say they really just eyeball the material, whether it's our material or anybody's, um, and it's just really not the way to go. Good manufacturing practices call for um, the right powder to liquid ratios. Those ratios may not uh, show up as anything glaring, but without the correct ratios, 
you could be weakening the products if you don't have the correct infiltration of liquid to powder. Uh, let me demonstrate to you what I'm talking about. Okay. So we were talking about uh, the way that we prepare the material before we begin to uh, proportionate. Um, and when the containers do come in, uh, most people want to do this. They want to shake it. And that would be for a one pounder, it would be for a five pounder, it doesn't matter. But for either type of container, any size container, what you want to do is you want to turn it from side to side. You want to have a sloshing motion. That sloshing motion infiltrates the material into it itself. By shaking it like this, as I mentioned earlier, the material rises and the heavy, stu the heavy material settles. And what will happen is after a period of use, you'll no longer have the same consistency of color. So again, back and forth, and you do this with both. I do it every time I pull the container out of the drawer to proportionate. Um, I, I give it a little roll like this just to get it mixed nicely. Uh, once we have it mixed and we want to start to proportionate, um, I mentioned earlier that we need to measure everything precisely. Now, I'll measure for a one, uh, for one arch, but for one arch it's 30 cc's. And let me just get that in there. Now, what I wanted to tell you about when we're, we're mixing the powder and liquid is, first off, when we're proportionating, it's a loose fill. One thing I always see is, uh, I've been into laboratories, I've seen the uh, a technician take, fill the container, and tap the container such. What happens is it's compacting the powder and now he goes ahead and he adds you know, more material until he gets what he wants and he continues to tap it until he gets the mark. The, the, the markings that we're looking for, oh, the markings that we're looking for. Okay, so remember a, a very loose pack, a loose fill, not a pack, but a loose fill of material. Um, so we'll do 30 cc's. Okay, and you'll notice I'm not going to tap it. I'm going to put it to the side, and then for the liquid, we're going to do 10. It's 30 to 10. Now, I mentioned earlier about the meniscus. Meniscus being uh, a bow in the liquid mark on the graduated cylinder. I'll show you what I mean. It's a little, it's, it, it's, it's like a, an arc, and you always take your measurement from the bottom of the arc. So when you're, when you're pouring the liquid, you want to make sure that you have uh, the meniscus is red rather than the line of liquid on the bottle. In other words, you'll notice that the line of liquid on the bottle is above 10, but the bottom of the meniscus is right at 10. That's where you take your measurement from. Believe it or not, if you were doing several dentures uh, worth the mix, uh, three vials that are a half a milliliter shy would mean a mill and a half uh, shy of liquid, which would really affect the product in the way uh, porosity and and uh, and also in the how fast it sets up and the packing consistency. So, um, as I mentioned, we'll pour the liquid, which is the 10 milliliters. And now, this is something critical that most laboratories don't do, and that is to add the powder. So we were talking about uh, proportionating. Uh, our liquid and powder correctly and I wanted to show you a couple things that I suggest when we're doing so. One is, and I've already pre-poured this, but where we read the actual line on the vial uh, is at the meniscus and if I was to lay this flat you could see it but it's the bow, it's at the bottom of the bow is actually where you take your reading. So I have it set for 10 and 30 cc's of powder. Here's the powder and with the, the powder, uh, when you're mixing the powder or putting the powder in the container don't tap it because if you tap it what will happen is it will compact, you'll add more powder and then you'll throw your powder and liquid ratios off. Um, once you've got those proportionated, however, the next step is uh, pouring your liquid into your container. This little container that I use is uh, from Renford. I bought it back when uh, old Claude was with Renford. And it's, um, as you can see, it's a flexible silicon bowl. And I've had it over 20 years. And I've poured my 10 cc's of liquid in there, or 10 milliliters of liquid in there. And now I will uh, put in my powder. Now, what I suggest with the powder is to sift it in and to turn it as you're sifting it. And you'll notice that it'll first just look like liquid, like water or like a liquid. And then what will happen is as I do it, it'll begin to solidify a little bit. What I'm doing is I'm wetting all the beads. If you have the correct ratio, which I do, uh, it'll start to stiffen. And then 
I'll show you how you get that to slump. And that's what you're really looking for is to wet all the beads. I'm still wetting, but you notice I'm not whipping any air into this. All I'm doing is I'm stirring it in. So I continue to mix this, and as I do, I continue to pour. Now you'll notice, I will show you here in a second, I'll tilt it towards you so you can see. But what happens is this begins to congeal. Okay, now I still have some powder left in there, but I want to show you that it has this consistency, which is a uh, it's it's becoming kind of thick again and I'm gonna add more now you're gonna say well gee that's gonna get kind of dry that's the, the most of it so but it's not really the case because what I'm gonna do is this what I'm gonna do is I'm going to mix it in a bit and then I'm going to perform some magic here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tap the container and as I tap the container you'll start to notice that the monomer will start to migrate through the material and come up through the top and again just enough to get that nice see how it's starting to slump again again you'd be surprised what a little tapping of the container does it brings all that liquid right up to the surface notice now it's not dry it's actually doughy and again we're going to be looking at the consistency of the pack next but this is the kind of doughy consistency you want it's thoroughly wet there are no dry particles as you can see I tend to scrape it from the sides and pull it in the forward and then what I do is I use this little cement spatula it works best for this use and I just turn the material in. See how I'm turning it in? Okay, once I get it to where I want it, and that's the beauty of this bowl, I can manipulate the bowl by bending it and it brings the material to the center. Okay, now once I've got that done, I've got a little cover and I'll stick that on there and I'll wait generally about 10 minutes uh, depending on the ambient temperature of the laboratory. On uh, hot days, of course, it's going to set up quicker. And during the winter, I find I get an extra two and a half to three minutes. And action. Okay, so we've waited about 10 minutes now. And I want to show you the first off the beauty of this little bowl. Look at this. I can press it against the sides, but when it pulls clean like that, we know it's time to pack. So I'll just take it out. I want to show you. This would be what we call doughy, but not sticky. See how it pulls apart? That's what we're looking for. Now I'll show you in a second here, a minute or two, actually what the material looks like when it's uh, snappy. If snappy's too late. This is about what you're looking for. See, it's not sticking to my fingers. It's kneadable. You'll notice I'm not using any gloves. I don't happen to have any kind of contact dermatitis or anything that I got uh, allergy-wise from the material. So I don't, you know, I'm not really that nervous about doing this for the, for the, uh, a demonstration. Obviously during the day when I'm working, if I'm doing a bunch of cases, I wouldn't handle the material like this without gloves over a duration of time. But because we're just going to give this one little demonstration, I just want to show you. Um, when you're going to pack the mold, and I'll show you that in a second, you always want to make sure that you roll it and pull it out. What that does is it aligns the fibers so that when you pack the fibers into the mold, um, they uh, align themselves and look more um, vertical than they do horizontal. So you want to make sure that you have that. Okay, now I've made this demonstration using just 30 cc's to 10 milliliters of liquid. Um, a, a lot of times I'll get calls from people saying, you know, by the time uh, they get to their fourth or fifth or sixth denture, the, the material seems to be too stiff. Well, yes, that, that, that's a fact because it takes a certain amount of time to pack the case and you're pushing yourself into that zone, into that, uh, d uh, that snappy stage. And so what I can suggest is this. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to do six dentures at a time, mix enough for three, wait about 10 minutes, and then mix up another uh, batch for three more. When one pops, you can pack those three cases, and by the time that the second batch is ready that, to, to pack, you'll be done packing the first set of three. It, you just have to stagger it. Uh, that works best. But a lot of times I'll get calls and people say, you know, half my cases had porosity and half my cases didn't. And I always ask, well, what was the number? Do you know which flasks were the ones that were number four, five, and six? Because generally it's always at the end of the pack uh, when you get those kind of problems. So anyways, just a little, little uh, information there. If you're staggering and you're doing a bunch of cases and you're staggering, you're uh, not staggering it, you might consider staggering. So we were talking about the different states of the material. I wanted to show you an example of what the snappy stage would be, just so you know. If your acrylic snaps just like that, 
it is becoming well past the time to pack. It'll start to stiffen really quick and generally if you start packing at this at this consistency what'll start to happen is you won't even get your mold closed all the way by the time you get it totally full. So again, I wanted you to see it's a snappy state and that's what we're talking about. See? See how it snaps? Before I pulled it, it just kind of stretched out. This is snappy. So again, you're packing them like this and getting some spotty porosities. You might want to think, uh, rethink when you pack these cases because they have to be in the doughy, not sticky consistency. Okay, so we're going to talk a bit. I'm going to show you a bit now what I was explaining about the mold preparation. I've already washed out the mold and um, with the uh, detergent and uh, a uh, surfactant cleaner and now what I've got to do is I'm, I'm leaving my molds warm because I'm going to add separator and as I mentioned earlier the separator is added to the model um, in warm layers rather than one warm layer and then subsequent cool layers and that's because we don't want separation of the layers to occur when we're packing the case. I've uh, devised this little box and you can see it's a hair dryer and a plastic box with some holes in it and the reason I put the holes in is it actually two reasons. One is so that the air can flow over the models and out and secondarily and most importantly is that there's a heat sensor that's inside of this uh, dryer that if there was just heat inside the box the heat would back up and turn the sensor off and this hair dryer would forever be turning itself off because of the fact that there's a backlog of heat. So with that in mind the molds stay warm, they dry quicker, um, allows the layers to uh, bond with each other. Now once, once it, it's uh, your second and third layer has dried, you'll have uh, dry mold. Uh, you'll have uh, the, the mold will be dry. It'll have a glossy surface to it, and then we we'll have to put those to the side because it's only advisable to pack the cases uh, when the mold is at room temperature. If we were to put that, uh, put acrylic in this and try to press this right now, you uh, make the chance of. Uh, uh, possibly causing the acrylic to become porous on the surface because you have uh, a warm mold which will dry the acrylic out on the contacting surface. Uh, I just wanted to show you here's a mold that's been washed out using a surfactant non-emollient containing uh, cleaner and the surface texture and I don't know if you can pick it up on the camera or not it's a matte finish there is no shiny spots. It's basically like bone dry. Like if you had bones in the sun and it dried them out, it's a bone dry surface. And it's the same way here on the opposing as well on the tissue bearing. And you can see bone dry and ready now to be prepared uh, with a separator. And I'm going to put these underneath of my, uh, of my drying box, I'll call it. And then we will go from there. While we're on the subject of coating these molds, let me show you the brushes that I use just to give you an idea of the best way to apply. For the broad surfaces, I'm, I'm using a flatter brush because if I was to use a number two brush to do the whole mold, it would take forever. So for the flatter surfaces, I use this broad brush and I can get into the palatal region. I can get along the top of the flange and any place where it's flat. Once I've gotten that area coated, I have a number two brush that I use. This brush here, it allows me to get interproximally. Remember, you do not want to pull any of your separator uh, in between the teeth because if you pull it in there, what will happen is, if you're not careful and it's not dried completely, is you'll get that porosity, that spot porosity we talked about earlier, that occurs right around the next of the teeth. So a number two brush, you can see the size of it, it's, it's, it's small, and I take that and I go interproximally and I stay off the teeth as much as possible. So what I'd like to show you here just real quickly is the different brush. And the different brush that I use for the interproximal is a number two. I hold it up against the surface so you can see. They, I go interproximally with this brush because that allows me to control any kind of puddling that might occur. We want to keep the puddling from occurring because that's where you're going to get those spot porosities around the necks of the teeth. And again, using a, a dry box, a drying box like I have, uh, that, that I use and, and suggest that will also help dry out those areas and keep that puddling from occurring. So again, the specialty brush of a number two, a broad flat brush for the broad areas around the palate, top of the flange and on the land areas. And again, the number two for the interproximal areas, 
to control the amount of material that goes around the necks of the teeth. So I'm going to add the, uh, the molds are warm. Um, I've cleaned them. They're underneath the box. I'm going to add my first coat of Cosep. And I'm just going to move this over to the side. This is that little box that I came up with. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the broad brush, the one for the land areas. And I'm just going to brush that over the areas as I mentioned earlier. It's a very simple, simple procedure everybody does. You just have to do it anyway, so we might as well show you how I do it anyways. And again, the broad areas are the ones where I use that big old flat brush. Then what I do is take the number two and I go in this area. What I want to do is make sure I don't puddle it. And then I'll go back to another broad brush. I try to do it all at one time rather than take breaks on it. First coat really is a covering coat and then we'll go from there. And again. Okay, and then I'll take the lower model and I'll coat that and that one there is not nearly as exacting because we're just looking for coverage. You can see the coverage. Very simple. I like the uh, Cosep material. It doesn't uh, lump. I'm not having any problems with that. I will tell you this, if you buy a big bottle of the uh, Cosep material, what I always do is I proportionate off a small amount for my daily use. In other words, in, if you're always going to be opening and closing the bottles, uh, the main bottle all the time, um, the air exposure is going to cause it to thicken and, and, and eventually will clump. Uh, so you can do yourself a favor and get as much life out of that big bottle, that big quart bottle or pint bottle, whatever it is that you purchase, by, like I say, pouring off a, an amount into a smaller container, and that way you're only opening up that small container for a period of time. And I have found that that uh, reduces the amount of thickening of the material uh, at that point. And we'll just let that dry some more. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to continue to add my second coat. My first coat is dry. And by the way, uh, somebody here asked me, how long does it take uh, between coats? And um, when the models are warm and the air is, is on it and your coats are not overdone, about two and a half to three minutes between coats. And maybe some of you might think, well, that's a little long, maybe, or maybe you think it's a little short. Um, I just find that if it's, if it's um, dry to the touch, then it's ready to go. And again, the second coat goes on, broad brush on that area, and then I'm going to take this one, and again, I'm going to go back over those broad flat areas, like the land areas first with the brush, and inside the palatal region. You might notice I'm using porcelain teeth. I don't have any specific brand that uh, I favor. Uh, many times people ask me in lectures and also when I'm at the shows what denture teeth I prefer. And I like to always tell them the same answer, which is I pick the teeth to match the patient and not the other way around. So I don't, I'm not really married to a tooth line. Uh, I use the, the, the teeth that are best suited for the individual. Um, and that comes true because um, some patients have lingualized occlusion. Some have 20 degree, some have 10 degree occlusion and they make teeth that match the anteriors with posterior, matching posteriors. And uh, so I have to take the occlusal, I have to take the uh, occlusal concept into mind when I'm selecting. Anterior teeth are funny. Um, all can be modified. And uh, so I don't really get all hung up. As long as I have the basic shape, which would be square ovoid or rectangular, I can modify any tooth to um, to fit the bill. As long as I have the basic shape, I can take and I can adjust the line angles using rubber wheels uh, to get what I need. So again, I don't really use any particular brand, but I uh, and this I use some porcelain teeth that I had. It's a nice uh, uh, nice looking tooth when I'm 
through. I'll show pictures of this on Facebook or someplace, and I'll make note to tell you that these were the teeth that I used in this particular video. All right, I'm going to cover that again, and we'll wait about two and a half, three minutes. Okay, I just wanted to show you real quickly, you know, I had questions about uh, can we colorize the nature curl using the subsurface technique? You can, but you have to prepare an amount of the material specifically for that technique. And I'll tell you what I mean. Uh, I'm going to take my regular standard super uh, high impact nature curl and I'm going to strain out the fibers. And the reason I strain out the fibers is because if I don't have, if I have fibers in it, then I'm going to have vascularity in my papillas, and papillas do not have vascularity. So I have to have a certain amount of material that um, doesn't have fibers in it. So I went out to Bed Bath & Beyond, and you can go any place you want, but I picked up a tea strainer. Um, basically that tea strainer has the right sieve to allow for me to remove the fibers, and let me show you how I do that. I just take a certain amount of that material, and uh, about that amount will be good. And then all you do is with a shaking motion back and forth, just rock it. And what will happen is you'll notice the acrylic will actually filter through, but it will leave the fibers. And I'll have to do this a couple of times, of course, because if I don't, uh, I'll still have a bunch of fibers in there. You can notice that's quite a bit of fiber in there. And then what I'll do with that fiber material is I'll reach off the screen here and I'll just dump them over here. I just want to show you that we're look. That's the kind of stuff we're looking at. That's what we'll be taking out. Okay. Now I'm going to take and I'm going to re-sift again. First, I have to pour it back into the container. I'll do this two or three times until I don't see any more fibers. Again, I'll go back and I'll pour the material in again. And then again, I'll rock it or bounce it, however you want to, whatever you want to call it. But you can see the fibers are still catching, but now not so many. This time around, very few. Okay. Then I'll take and I'll uh, re, I'll uh, report back into another container. I continue to go back and forth from the same container. You, if you had a box lid, and that's what I generally use, is a box lid. And I'll go back and forth, and I'll clean out. Um, a good a fair amount of this material until it's fiber free and then I'll place it in a bottle that I have over to the side. What I do with this is this material um, is placed like I said interproximally when I begin begin the um, procedure and what it does is it keeps it keeps the color the same but because there's no fibers I'm not chasing the vascularity uh, interproximally and that's what I'm really looking for here. I won't use this except just around the teeth and, and, and specifically between the teeth. And I, all I'll do is I'll sift some of that powder in using a little container that I have here. And uh, I bought a henna, you're going to laugh, that's for henna, uh, doing henna art on a person. These little uh, tips and it provides a, a, the right amount of material to be able to um, apply to the mold. So again, I'll clear out that amount. And then I'll put it in a bottle like this, and as you can see, no fibers. Okay, so I'm going to show you the subsurface colorization. And uh, now I, what I'm going to do is, as I mentioned and showed earlier, I've taken this Nature Krill, which is in the original shade, and I've sifted out the fibers. And the reason I've done that, again, is because I don't want vascularity on the papillas. So uh, the next step is to place it where? Well, to place it where the papillas would be, and then to wet it with monomer. So I'm going to grab my brush, and then I'm going to start. And typically I would start a timer uh, for 10 minutes. Uh, and at that time I would also mix up my uh, material, my uh, base resin, uh, the original, super high impact nature curl. And I would set my timer for 10 minutes, and then I would proceed. That gives me 10 minutes to get this mold filled with color. By the time the material is ready to pack, I want to be done with the colorization technique. Okay, so we'll just we'll, we'll start now, and I'll start to place the material. So what I do is I go and I just real fast take this sifted material and place it. What I do is I do about half of it, and then I wet my brush, and I take the brush, and then I just touch it. It wicks. Okay.